Hello. Uh, good evening for those of you who are uh, in the U.S. or somewhere in North America. Um, and good morning to those of you who are uh, in the other part of the, uh, in the other hemisphere uh, in Australia or uh, in the Asia time zones. Uh, my name is Samuel Chu. I'm the president of the Campaign for Hong Kong. Uh, welcome. I want to welcome everybody for joining us this evening. I'm really, really excited about this conversation uh, that um, is featuring uh, the author, award-winning journalist, Louisa Lim, who uh, did, has just written a new book uh, called The Indelible City, Dispossessions uh, and Defiance uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, I want to spend a few minutes just to uh, get people oriented into uh, the stream and let people a chance to come in before I introduce uh, the two guests uh, for the, the conversation this evening. And I also want to thank uh, a number of um, North American Hong Kong groups that uh, are co-hosting our conversation today. Uh, those include the Hong Kong Forum in Los Angeles, uh, one of the oldest, uh, longest uh, standing uh, oversee Hong Kong groups uh, in, 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 the, in the world, uh, and Sirius for Hong Kong in Seattle. Uh, and then the uh, Canadian Hong Kong link um, that is uh, part of our network uh, in Canada, as well as the, uh, the Hong Kong uh, network, uh, academic network, uh, that is a new group of uh, academics and students and researchers uh, who are um, here in the U.S. So I want to thank all of them for co-hosting and, and, and for being here and joining us today. And we are here, if you're just joining us uh, for In Conversation uh, with Louisa Lim and Victoria Timbohoy uh, to talk about Louisa's new book. Um, and if I um, can entice you to stay throughout the conversation as we, uh, before introduce them, is that we are giving out five free copies of Louisa books. Um, and the way to get it is that from time to time, you will see during the live stream that like you see right now in the bottom, there's a link that you can go to uh, to put in your information. And we will select tomorrow by, I think it ends, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, tomorrow afternoon. Um, but you can enter your information. We are going to randomly select five people from the list and we will send you a copy of Louisa's uh, book for free. And uh, so it's uh, it's a little bit of an incentive here for you to uh, to stay throughout the stream. We'll, we'll put that link up again uh, during the, the, the next um, hour as we uh, enter the conversation. Um, so without further ado, I am going to um, pass it on. And first, let me introduce uh, a, a, a great friend and, and someone who has been um, a not only a friend, but a, a guide and, and a support uh, throughout this uh, long journey uh, of, of fighting and, and speaking and, and talking about Hong Kong and trying to help bridge and interpret uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, Dr. Victoria Timpo Hui, who um, is joining us, I, th I believe, from, uh, from New York. And, um, and I will let her take over. And remember, uh, we're giving out five free copies of the book. Feel free to click on the link. We'll see, you'll, we'll put the link up from time to time during the live stream. But without taking any further time away from our main attractions, um, I want to pass it on to Victoria. Thank you, Samuel. I suppose that the main attraction is Louisa. And I'm so pleased to actually have, an, have a book talk with uh, Louisa because several years ago, I already um, had hosted a book talk of Louisa's earlier book, The People's Republic of Amnesia. And so this time I'm doing this again in another book. And with The People's Republic of Amnesia, I actually have it as a, one of the assigned readings in my a course on contention in China. And this book by Louisa on Hong Kong, I'm going to assign it too, but in another course, Hong Kong decolonized and recolonized. So thank you so much for you know giving us this opportunity to int introduce Louisa's book. I have a lot of questions for Louisa, and it is also quite interesting to note that 
among a lot of the books on Hong Kong lately, Louisa's is actually a very unique one in the sense that this book is written by both a researcher with a PhD, someone who knows how to conduct research, but also a journalist. And therefore she knows how not just about investigative journalism, digging through arch archives and talking to people and tracing, you know, finding the little hints and then go, go dig down and, and track a lot of the, the little sources. But also this is a very readable book. It is a journalistic account combined with very deep research. Um, I want people to read all the books on Hong Kong, but you know, this is a must read among them. So welcome to Louisa. Oh, thank you so much, Victoria. And thank you, Samuel, for organizing this event. Yeah, thank you, Louisa. Maybe we can be, we can begin by kind of like, you know, just going over you, you, anything in particular you would like to say. If not, then I would really love to ask you. The book begins with the King of Kowloon. And then the book title has several keywords, indelible, defiance, dispossession. Maybe you could tell us something about these keywords and also how the King of Kowloon then really can shed light on how we should understand Hong Kong. Absolutely. So um, I, maybe I should just start for those people who don't know, maybe I'll start with showing a picture of the King of Kowloon, oh dear, um, which is in the back of my book here. So the King of Kowloon um, is this extraordinary figure who I kind of became a bit obsessed with. Um, and anyone growing up in Hong Kong in um, really from the 1960s, 70s onwards would, would know who he was. Um, he was an old man. He was a, a, a trash sorter. Um, he was disabled. And many people, when I was a child, um, thought he was crazy because he believed that the peninsula of Kowloon, which is opposite Hong Kong, um, which had been given to the British in 1860 after the Second Opium War, he believed that it had or originally belonged to his family and had been stolen from them uh, by the British. So he spent um, you know, almost half a century writing across the city uh, in his very distinctive calligraphy, his claims to the land. And maybe I'll show that again so people can see the picture, anyone who doesn't know. So this is a, an example of his calligraphy. This was actually taken in his flat, um, in his apartment. And um, those two big words at the back say, emperor. Oh, and he claimed the peninsula of Kowloon as his own. And I was just so fascinated by him because to me, he the ideas that he was thinking and talking about territory, sovereignty, loss, land, these were at the heart of Hong Kong's sort of political proposition. And he was thinking about them so long before everybody else. And so I think he was my starting point for this book. Um, and really one of the reasons why we called it indelible city, because one of the things that the King of Kowloon would do was that there were certain spots that he liked to paint on and um, the government really didn't like his work. I mean, lots of people didn't like his work. You know, at the beginning, he was very much seen as a vandal who was, you know, despoiling the city. Um, you know, this is in a time before Banksy and Keith Haring and all these kind of artists. Um, and so every time he painted somewhere, government cleaners would go and they would either paint over it or they would uh, wash it away. And he would often go back and paint on the same places over and over again. So there's still these sites around Hong Kong that have layers upon layers of his work, which is hidden. Uh, um, so that was one of the things that I was thinking about when I was thinking about Hong Kong, the sort of um, things can be removed, but there are layers and layers of history and memory in Hong Kong that, that cannot be forgotten. Um, the other thing I should say about the King of Kowloon is that although he started as this sort of very eccentric figure, you know, a, a crank, um, in 1997, he was given an art exhibition, which was um, quite controversial, you know, it was quite a circus. Um, 
And a lot of people were really opposed to it because uh, particularly these sort of established artists because they thought his calligraphy was really bad. It's really ugly. You know, it looks like a child writing. And, you know, he's someone who's been fined by the police. He's been sent to psychiatric um, institutions. Um, but he was given an art exhibition uh, at a really prominent site. And it was um, sponsored by the arts development um, the arts funding body. And after that, he became an artist. You know, people, are very famous curators, put his work alongside Chairman Mao's in an exhibition that traveled overseas. And eventually he went to um, represent Hong Kong at the Venice Biennale. Um, his work was selling, you know, a piece sold for a quarter of a million dollars at Sotheby. He became, at one point, Hong Kong's most valuable artist, and he sort of became this cultural icon. You know, there's rap songs to him and jazz songs um, and poets write poems to him, and, you know, fashion designers use his work. And so he's sort of a commodity as well. And I was just so fascinated by the King of Kowloon. And so he was kind of the prism through which I started by looking at Hong Kong's story. That's amazing. So I, I also remember that when I was younger, I would be walking along the street and I would see those, I, would, I consider that graffiti. I thought that, you know, anyone who claims to be the emperor, the king of Kowloon has to be insane. So <laughs> then how, in a way that, how did he become such a cultural icon? And then some, somehow suddenly, you know, something that used to look ugly and people didn't care about became kind of like this, one of the best selling in, um, our, our artists and artworks. But then at the same time, we know that now that the M plus is reopened and his work is featured in the center. So, and then at the same time, of course, your book is not about that. Not, your book is not about, you know, Hong Kong's art scene, but uh, rather really about Hong Kong's protest and the movement. So how then there seem to be two narratives about this guy. Are they, are they competing with each other or do people, different people look at his legacy in different ways? People see in it what they want to see. So how then do we reconcile the two, two ways of at least two ways of using him? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. That's a really good question. So I actually interviewed the um, head curator, uh, Pauline uh, Yao at M Plus. So M Plus is this massive visual arts museum that's um, opened quite recently, many years behind schedule um, in Hong Kong. And they have a huge pair of doors by the King of Kowloon, which is front and center of the very first gallery on the ground floor. And it's a gallery about Hong Kong's visual culture. So this is the first thing that visitors see. And I asked her this question, you know, I said, um, you know, why do you think he's so important to Hong Kong's visual culture? And she said, well, he's really a meme. He's become a meme. Um, and I think in many ways, he, he was a meme before memes existed. People read all kinds of different things into his work, you know. I think at first people thought he was crazy. But after when he had his exhibition, um, he started to become popular. And then there was a um, actually a television ad for a cleaning product called Swipe, which is a very humorous ad that starred him. And after um, that ad came out, people were seeing him in their living rooms and they began to see him differently as a kind of celebrity, you know, a lovable uncle rather than a crazy old guy on the streets. And also, you know, his work began to be worth something. Um, he died in 2007. And when he died, there's, you know, there was a lot of newspaper coverage. And this also, you know, it was interesting that every piece of coverage would use the term King of Kowloon, you know, and use it very unquestioningly. And I think that also changed his status because um, even if it was being used sarcastically, people started to sort of adopt him in a weird way. Um, so I think he took on this kind of significance. And I mean, you know, when I was, so I, I did a PhD 
looking at the press coverage of him and I went back and talked to all those people who had written about him in the media and it was just really fascinating because I realized that um, these were the people who had written him were the people who were thinking about land and sovereignty and localism long before other people so he was almost like <laughs> it, it, <laughs> he gave people a way to think about these issues that couldn't be voiced um, you know, uh, there's a curator, Oscar Ho, who said, you know, it's almost like he's a shaman, only when you go crazy can you speak the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was an element of that. But I mean, he was also a meme. So, mm -hmm. you know, people used him in various ways, I think, you know, he's, to some people, he symbolized the idea of, um, um, sort of Hong Kong spirit when he died, there were all these uh, newspaper editorials saying, you know, he worked really hard and he got up every morning at seven and went out to paint on the streets and he didn't, um, you know, he didn't want Gucci clothes and, you know, he lived this very simple life. So, you know, there was a sort of class element to it as well, that he was someone who came from nowhere and became really famous. And then later on, you know, people almost thought of him, you know, he, he was almost like a localist, right? He was claiming Hong Kong as his own. Um, you know, the writer Fung Mai said he was the last free man in Hong Kong because he um, he was his own sovereign, a self-governing mm. territory. So to that extent, um, you know, he, he, I think he's really interesting as a symbol that can be interpreted in all kinds of different ways, but also, um, I, once the protests started and the umbrella movement in 2014, and we began to see these Lenin walls, these walls of calligraphy and post-it notes that are appearing all over Hong Kong, those really mimicked his methods. And I mean, I know, you know, he's not the only one to do it, but I, I feel like in particularly in 2019, when we started to see graffiti everywhere appearing all over the streets, um, to me, there were all these echoes of the King of Kowloon. And then when the government started covering up all the protest slogans on the streets, you know, they often covered them up yeah. poorly. And you could see these, uh, you know, squares of different colours where they tried to paint out protest slogans. And, um, you know, on, on the tram stops where they tried to smudge out all the slogans. And it really drew attention, I think, to the slogans because you started to try and figure out what are the words behind these squares. And that also kind of reminded me of the King of Kowloon and all these sort of layers of protest calligraphy that he had left, you know, over the city for so many years. Sorry, that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> Well, that is fascinating. So in a way that, so why then do you think that Hong Kong people would call a lot of those that, you know, that when they put up posters and post its notes that they call those Lennon walls, rather than King of Kowloon walls? Or Deng Do Choi uh, uh, walls? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know that he has so much resonant, resonance for young people because he did mm -hmm. die in 2007. So if you were growing up later, you might not, um, have grown up with his words mm. around you. I don't know if they would talk to you in the same way. But it is interesting that I think he still lurks in the consciousness. Um, there's a singer called Michael Lai who mm. sang a song quite recently, a, a couple of years ago, he released a song which had this line, the king of Kowloon is me, um, Kowloon city is mine. So I, I don't know why people didn't use, I mean, I guess the method is not, quite the same um, and Lennon walls is, is e easier to say but um, you know I have to say it was also a question that I had in my mind you know is it just me that's obsessed with the King of Kowloon <laughs> but then when I went to talk to people and I, you know I, I just found that he had led me to such interesting thinkers and artists and singers that it, it was almost like picking a path, you know, almost like breadcrumbing my trail um, to people who I wouldn't ordinarily have met. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, it, it was like a guiding 
inspiration, I think, for this mm -hmm. book. That's great. Um, then what about, earlier you mentioned that um, he kind of represents localism before the idea and the concept actually was it were even born. So how does he then kind of like, also you, the, your whole book has a lot about the Hong Kong identity, how people define the Hong Kong identity. And even though it was once so marginalized. And so how does then he, how, how does he symbolize that kind of localism? I you know that you mentioned, you know, this is my territory, this is my kingdom. But beyond that, you know, what else that he symbolizes? You, the, the local political climate, the political culture. Yeah. It, I mean, there's the idea that this territory is mine, but I think he also um, symbolized other things as well. And one of them is the idea that you struggle for what is right, even if you don't necessarily know, mm -hmm. even if, uh, even if you, you know, you're not confident that it will work. And very early on when he was interviewed, and he often didn't make much sense, but he, he was interviewed uh, and he, they said to him, why are you doing this? Because... You know, do you think you'll get the land back? And he said very clearly, I don't think I will get the land back. So they said, well, why are you doing this? And he said, to show show people. Mm. And I felt when the protest started in 2019, I felt that spirit really strongly mm. on the streets where people, you know, that would really, you know, would really turn out in to support these ideals and you know really to show people the strength of the community um and I you know I remember very early on when someone was interviewed a young man during the protests and he was asked do you think um you know these protests will reach their aim and he said no and the reporter said why did you come and he said at, at least you tried and I think that's that kind of spirit um that kind of, the spirit of at least you tried is a spirit that um, was really epitomized in many ways by the King of Kowloon. That's great. Um, so earlier you mentioned the song, and um, what is the name of the song? Oh, it's a very funny song. It's by Michael Lai, L-A-I. I think it's called My England, My English Ain't No Good but it might be my England ain't no good. And it's a very funny song because it's kind of in Hong Kong English, Konglish. And it has a lot of these sort of Hong Kong icons in it, um, you know, Hong Kong foods. And yeah, it, it's a very funny song. I'll, I'll look for the link uh, and see if I can post it. Um, yeah, it. we can share it later. Don't worry about it. Um, but so essentially what you see in him is that his life and what he what he has what he did and also the way that the government tried to erase him but then at the same time he just kept coming back this is essentially just this idea the, the resilience and the humble origin all of those you find parallels with the political struggle itself throughout um, you know basically the periods that you you have covered and and then this also kind of take us to the point, you know, among a lot of the, you, you need to talk to a lot of the protesters, you also talk to a lot of politicians. What stories strike you the most? Oh, um, gosh, it's hard to say. I spoke to so, so many people um, in the course of writing this book. Um, you know, I, um, I was, you know, I mean, particularly there was some sort of, I, I spoke to many people kind of over the years. So I kept going back and talking to the same people again and again. And that was really interesting to see the kind of evolution of their views. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I went back in and looked at, um, the interviews that I'd done, you know, I was quite struck that, for example, people like Benny Tai I'd interviewed, uh, who, who was the uh, co-founder of Occupy Central, I'd interviewed him again and again and again. And it, 
just to watch the evolution of his views. I mean, I remember I interviewed him right after the Umbrella Movement when he said, um, you know, he was very confident that that uh, he would not get in trouble, that the law would protect <laughs> him. Um, and, you know, he even spoke about how at the university, you know, he'd just received a bit, some research funding. So he thought his research was protected. And, and you know, now, um, you know, and then over the years, I spoke to him sort of many times and that evolution of people's views and their loss of trust in Hong Kong's institutions as the rule of law has become chipped away has been really, really sad. So there have been, you know, that really has sort of, sort of stuck with me. But then there were many other interviews, you know, particularly during the protests where I spent a lot of time on the streets and I spoke, you know, interviewed a lot of very young protesters, you know, 15 year olds who were willing, you know, to contemplate going to prison for 10 years for rioting charges because they thought Hong Kong was in its end game. You know, to me, this was an astonishing, um, you know, willingness to to put themselves on on the line so yeah there were many different interviews that i just many different moments that um just really struck me this is why everyone has to read the book because there are really tons of stories about basically very astonishing stories and then of course um also louisa's own take on a lot of these uh, uh people as well and and um we can also turn to, uh, you also mentioned that Hong Kong, in a way, the identity is also situated actually throughout history. You also talk about, you know, um, even mm, during the Song Dynasty already that Hong Kong had these rebellions. So Hong Kong's identity is also tied to its in-betweenness and it's always been rebellious. So can you also explain more about that? And then also through your understanding of, for example, Benny Tai's evolution of his views, it seems that people used to have hope and people were willing to die for, to, 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 you know, in order to realize the hope. But now with the crackdown, what is left there? Is there anything left at all? So um, let me talk about your first question first. Um, I think the, I, you know, I think, what I was really interested in when I was thinking about Hong Kong was also the question of its history. Mm -hmm. um, because growing up as a child in Hong Kong, we really had drummed into us this idea that Hong Kong had been a barren rock, nothing was there before the British arrived. It was due to Britain's influence that it became this great mart for trade and international city. Um, you know, the British brought all these things, education, a legal system, you know, finance, commerce to Hong Kong. I never really questioned it. Um, and it was interesting that I never really questioned it because my mother um, did a lot of research on Hong Kong's cultural heritage and did it, wrote guidebooks, cultural heritage guidebooks to Hong Kong. And so really, you know, I spent my childhood being dragged around the new territories, looking at temples and really dusty study halls and sacred trees. And, you know, at the time I was really bored by it. I just thought it was dull. I wanted to be sunbathing and, you know, buying clothes and having fun. And instead my mother was taking me to look at archeological sites. Um, but I think, and then I, you know, I realized that all those years I'd kind of, even though I'd seen the archeological evidence that there were things happening in Hong Kong before the British. There was this kind of dissonance because of our education system that we really didn't really think about it that deeply. And so those two narratives, and then after China came, it imposed a completely different narrative of Hong Kong history. And I mean, you know, I would also say it's interesting that the British actually um, suppressed, you know, they didn't teach 
any Hong Kong history in Hong Kong schools. And this was intentional. They just didn't want Hong Kongers to have an idea of their own sort of history. Um, they didn't want too strong a sense of Hong Kong identity to emerge because that might make things difficult for them. And then, you know, after China, um, after the return to Chinese sovereignty, then China started with its own kind of um, narrative, which is, you know, Hong Kong has been part of China from time immemorial. And that, um, and, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's almost like a repository of Chinese culture where they had sort of schools way back in the Song Dynasty. Um, and so it was a really different view of Hong Kong history. And it was really interesting to look at how these two ideas of history mm. bifurcated and what they had in common. And, you know, the, the I, and I was just very interested also in the fact that Hong Kong has been a place of rebellion, you know, way back in the 11th and 12th century, there were um, salt rebellions in Lantau where the villagers did not want to pay tax. They were illegally harvesting salt and the central authorities, you know, um, were were sent troops to put them down and even before that you know the the you know the legend is that Lantau was settled by Chu Yuan in the fifth century who was a, a um a general who fought the central authority and fled so you know I was just really interested in that other kind of history the the other you know, that really long history of Hong Kong as a place of rebellion and, and a place of dissent. I find that really interesting because there's been this conversation um, among Hong Kong people because um, essentially, of course, the Chinese view is that Hong Kong has always been a part of China. And so, you know, case closed. Whereas um, I also see that some young people what really want to see history. It's kind of like, you know, it's the British who open up, you know, uh, Hong Kong. But what you're, you're suggesting is that it is true that, you know, um, Hong Kong was there in the Song Dynasty. Hong Kong was not just, you know, a, a pile of barren rocks, but that history is a lot more nuanced, it's a lot more complicated, it's full of rebellious, rebelliousness that Hong Kong has always been a place against central power. That is a part, I would say that, you know, something has not really been um, covered much, even in the academia. So thanks so much for digging up that. So that's actually the part I enjoy the most because I myself uh, also works on, on the, that's works on Chinese history. But let oh, me, oh, yeah, go ahead. I should quickly say there is amazing academic work which is being done and which I drew on really heavily for this. Um, there's some really interesting work on Hong Kong's role as a the Guanfu salt farm and what role it played in it, it, it you know, as a salt farm for the empire and stuff like that that um, is being done and is worth looking at if you're interested in that kind of thing. Okay, great. So all of those. So then the question is, you know, how do we study Hong Kong's history? And But I, I'll set the question aside because I have other more burning questions to ask you. You you have one chapter that talks that kind of talks about the uh, unofficial members of the exec executive council and the legislative council at the time. None were elected at the time. And... At, they wanted to represent Hong Kong. They wanted to speak for Hong Kong, but their voices were completely sidelined, ignored, not just by Beijing, but also by London. Now today, the, a lot of people are grateful for um, the, London's new policy to grant the BNO, uh, people eligible to, for the BNO can act and have a pathway to citizenship. But at the time, that demand was just not even you know, um, discussed. It was, it was set aside. What do you think is London's uh, role, you know, given today's how one can treat the systems, the model, all the promises, the basic law and the British Joint Declaration, they all set aside, they all trashed. And you argue that London betrayed Hong Kong. So what could they or what should they have done? Well, I mean, that's a really big question. So... When I was writing the book, what happened was I came across this archive of interviews just sitting on a library shelf in Oxford. Um, the interviews done by 
Hong Kong political sci scientist, Steve Chang, who's in SOAS now. And um, he had promised the interviewees that they would be kept um, confidential for 30 years from the last incident described. And some of them had been released and had been written about by academics, but many of them had not. And when I started reading these interviews, I realized that here was the story that had not been heard. Here was the Hong Kong voice that had never, um, because these unofficials, and they were really senior bankers and lawyers and industrialists, they'd been appointed by Hong Kong, by Britain, um, to give them advice. But when they tried to give advice, they were really ignored. You know, really what Britain wanted was that they should sell to Hong Kongers the agreement to return Hong Kong to China. Uh, they wanted to use them. And I think they, British were maybe a little bit surprised when the unofficials turned out not to be so pliant. You know, in public, they were very, they were, you know, they were all obsessed by honor. They wanted to do the right thing. They had signed the Official Secrets Act. They weren't allowed to publicly say what they think, thought. But in private, in this archive of interviews, it's this sort of extraordinarily anguished um, voice comes through where we can see that the unofficials were warning of all the things that have happened now. They warned of them back then in the 80s. And Britain, um, and Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime Minister in particular, was very insistent that, um, you know, that they, uh, sh she listened to them, but she didn't do anything, you know? And there was a British policy for quite a long time of making sure the unofficials didn't know exactly what was going on because they needed to keep them on side. So, you know, they, the, you, if you look at newly released diplomatic memos, they talk about how, um, how, you know, the advice to cabinet ministers and prime minister was to let the unofficials think that they were being taken into their confidence, but not really tell them everything. And the unofficials really, you know, they kicked up a fuss. They came to Britain, they lobbied parliament, they went to Beijing and they, um, S.Y. Chung, the most senior of them, he uh, said directly to Deng Xiaoping, this is what we're worried about. We're worried that after, you know, we trust you, but what happens if China changes? What happens if future generations of Chinese leaders are more leftist? Uh, what happens if in future China is not, China does not allow Hong Kongers to rule Hong Kong? Um, and Deng Xiaoping didn't want to listen. He didn't want to address these. You know, he cut the meeting short and, you know, he blamed S.Y. Chung for raising this. He said, you know, it's not Hong Kongers who don't have confidence, it's you. But, you know, these were really good questions. And I think what the unofficials were doing were they were showcasing all the weaknesses in the agreement and neither Britain nor China really wanted to address these because it, both of them wanted to sign a, a deal as quickly as possible. And it was interesting the way in which the unofficials, you know, they felt that and they expressed it and they kept telling Margaret Thatcher that, you know, how do you know that China will keep its word? What mechanisms are there if China violates the joint declaration if it doesn't keep to its word. And she really didn't have any answers for them. She said to them, you know, China wouldn't like, you know, it wouldn't like to lose face in the international community, but they really didn't have any answers. And the thing that was most striking to me was that, um, you know, secretly she agreed with them. She knew that the points they were raising was were really valid, and we know this because there's even you know a document where she is written on the side in her handwriting. You know, it seems the unofficials were right mm. in their um, in you know in their assessment of the Chinese position. So it's a really sad thing, you know, to look back at at this archive now and see how correct they were. I mean, what could have been different? I don't know what could have been different, but I actually, you know, I asked that question to Chris Patton, the last governor of Hong Kong. I did ask him, do you think 
it would have made any difference if they had been listened to. And he said he thought that it would have made some mm -hmm. difference. I don't know what difference it would have made, but what I wanted to do and what I really wanted to do with the whole book is to try and sort of restore that Hong Kong voice mm -hmm. because Hong Kong's history, whether it's the, you know, whether it's the history of ancient times or the history of the joint declaration or the history of the protests is always being written for it by colonial, you know, sovereign powers. And Hong Kongers are often so absent Hong Kong voices are so absent and I wanted to try and write something that really centered Hong Kong voices so there's a historian called Tim Ko who I went to interview and I asked him about colonial history books and he said there are no Chinese faces no Chinese voices and that really st stuck with me that you know the lack of Hong Kong faces and voices so that's what I wanted to do was just restore those so people knew what had happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so sad. So then early on, um, London wanted to erase or set aside or blur Hong Kong faces. And now it seems that Hong Kong voices are also being silenced by Beijing. So in this situation, maybe you can also tell us about, you know, the current crackdown. And then if, you know, all of those expectations from the 1980s have turned out to be true, well, then what difference um, is, you know, what has happened to one country, two systems? That also gets tied to your last book on the tenement amnesia, because I particularly remember one chapter, you, you discuss a student, university student from Guangzhou visiting Hong Kong, and he went to the candlelight vigil. He went to the June 4th Museum. And he said that in Hong Kong, he could breathe freedom. That is the most striking thing that I got from your last book. Now then, now today, the June 4th Memor uh, Museum has been forced to shut down. The Alliance is uh, shut down. Most of the executives, officials in charge, officers in charge, they are uh, in, uh, under arrest or already uh, sentenced. And if the same students now comes to Hong Kong, what would he find? Would Hong Kong just look like, you know, the rest of China? I mean, I, I don't think it looks like the yet rest of China yet, but I think, I mean, I think it's, it's different in many ways. Hong Kong as a place um, when it comes to freedom of expression, I think in many ways, Hong Kong is, sometimes more perilous than China, because in China, the red lines are really clear. It's, you know, everybody knows what you're allowed to speak about and, and what you're not allowed to speak about um, and what the penalties are. Whilst in Hong Kong, since the national security legislation has been introduced, you know, all kinds of things have come under the category of, uh, you know, national security crimes, you know, things like having banners or stickers with protest slogans, you know, um, even clapping in court the other day, mm -hmm. six people were arrested. This was said to be a seditious offence. They were arrested by the National Security Police for clapping in court. So I think, you know, Hong Kong has changed so dramatically. Um, it's, it's not the same as the mainland. But it's, um, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's a different, uh, but, you know, and I guess to come back to the question of amnesia and indelibility, um, I, I can see there's a question um, from Catherine about the name of the book. Um, I, I just do think that it is that, uh, one of the big differences between China and Hong Kong is the people. You know, in China, amnesia was possible. You know, so many young people in China today really have no idea what happened on June the 4th, 1989. You know, the government has succeeded in many ways in rewriting history and excising things. But I don't think that will be possible in Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kongers have really shown that, um, you know, they will 
use whatever means they can to sort of continue. You know, even like last year when uh, the Tiananmen vigil was banned because of COVID, um, people still gathered and walked around Victoria Park. And then at eight minutes past eight, or they took out their phones and uh, turned on the torches. And, you know, I think it was a sign that Hong Kongers will, um, will, you know, they treasure the freedoms that they have uh, or that they, uh, you know, the, those values, they treasure those values. The, I mean, the freedoms are rapidly disappearing and they will um, not forget these things that sort of memories and minds cannot be reformatted. And we're seeing that Hong Kongers are more willing to leave Hong Kong um, and raise their families and live elsewhere than to live under a system where these kind of ideological constraints are being imposed on them. So I guess uh, that that's one reason why we use the word in, indelible, because uh, uh, the city itself, um, you know, things may change, but I think in Hong Kongers, uh, have you know those memories cannot you know minds cannot be captured in the same kind of way <laughs> yeah thank you in a way that i so the the audience question you know how explain the the, the key words in the book title indelible uh, if this possession and defiance uh, louisa actually uh, answered that in, in early on is indelible and why we talk about why the book begins with the king of kowloon's because you know he had these um he he wrote on, on on rocks in in the middle of the city, and then the governments didn't like that, and he raised it, painted over it. But then he would go back to rewrite. Kind of reminds us of the London walls that you know they got torn down, they got covered, but people would continue to go back. So that that's another part about being indelible. And this possession is also that Hong Kong voices are always buried, they're always ignored, they're always marginalized and sidelined. And defiance is that kind of like people keep coming back. So there are layers of res resilience and resistance. Um, at the same time, though, we can, you know, we can take this on more is that there's some people think that um, why that the crackdown has been so severe and people, while some of them want to leave, but then a lot, there've been so many arrests and people were not prepared for that. And is that because Hong Kong people were not paying enough attention to what's been going on inside China to dissidents? And are there lessons that Hong Kong people can learn for, you know, if Chinese dissidents have managed to survive under increasingly tightening repression, how can Hong Kong people survive this current wave of, you know, basically this repression getting worse and worse? So not just the national security law, but also um, becoming Article Twenty Three and fake news law and all of those. Yeah, it's an incredibly hard situation. Um, you know, th this sort of welter of legislation is so broad and so vague and applied so much and you know I, just in the last week I think the cancellation of the human rights press awards by the foreign correspondence club in Hong Kong is a real s symbol of um, the fear that Hong Kongers feel and I think that fear is a fear that Hong Kongers overseas feel as well because the national security legislation is um, extraterrestrial, extraterritorial, sorry, not extraterrestrial. You know, it, it's, it can be applied globally. Um, and I really, you know, it, it, it's uh, how to survive this is a really hard question to answer. Um, I just wrote a piece for the Financial Times, which is gonna come out um, this, actually today, later today, about communities in exile. And I wrote about our experience in here in Australia of um, going to watch uh, Revolution of Our Times, the film by Kiwi Chow, which um, is banned, of course, in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, it was a really interesting moment because I think that... Um, he, you know, you, you could almost see 
these communities in exile beginning to coalesce where there had not been communities before. And, you know, what was interesting to me was the way in which the film really shows how the national security legislation is designed to atomize civil society. It's designed to destroy these bonds between Hong Kongers. Uh, uh, and, you know, one of the ways that it does it is fear. You know, when we watched the film, there were so many scenes where people were willing to put themselves in harm's way to protect other people who were nobody that they knew, not their friends or their family or anything, just other Hong Kongers. And we're seeing old, you know, old, older people, senior citizens putting their lives at risk to protect young people. And it was just really um, so moving. And then yesterday, Kiwi Chow, the filmmaker, released this video for the Australia, Hong Kongers in Australia. And he said, you know, what can the community in exile do? The one thing that we can do together is overcome fear and to face it head on. And I just thought that was really interesting. You know, his view was that watching the film and that coming together was just the start of something. I'm not sure if I've answered your question in any way. Yeah, that's great because uh, one, uh, one of the audience questions also is, you know, how could people continue, you, those who want to stay, then um, can do so without jeopardizing their physical security. So people leave. It, actually, another really striking incident recently is that a PORI, a Public uh, Opinion Research Institute, is uh, executive former executive director, uh, he said that I, for so long, I try to resist. I do to try to resist succumbing to fear, but then in the end, it's it's people continue to attack me. People continue to at attack what I do. So then I couldn't bear it any longer. So I decided to leave Hong Kong. So so is leaving Hong Kong the only solution to overcoming fear? What about those who are staying? What could they do to overcome that fear? And we also know that beyond those who are already arrested, beyond those who are worried about the knock on the door at 6 a.m., which is, you know, when the national security police tend to come to arrest people. What else do, what, what could people inside Hong Kong, what can they do to maintain the kind of community and conquer that fear? It's really hard for me to comment about what people inside Hong Kong can do because, um, I'm not there, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, when I was writing that piece for the Financial Times, and I talked to Ted Hoy, the Demo former Democratic Party politician who's in Australia now, and he said, you know, as someone who is able to speak, I feel that it is my duty to do so. So that question about overseas Hong Kongers, what can they do to help those remaining in Hong Kong? without jeopardizing their safety? It's a really good question. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, when I was writing my book, I removed a lot of names and details of people inside Hong Kong to, to try and protect them. I think, you know, to, to help people in Hong Kong without jeopardizing their safety is a really tricky thing to do when even, you know, the act of sending money from overseas to Hong Kong can, can be, you know, seen as collusion with foreign forces. It's really, you know, those red lines are everywhere. But I think one thing that can be done is just to try and keep, you know, keep Hong Kong in the public consciousness. I think mm -hmm. after Ukraine, Hong Kong has slipped off the map and that has allowed um, you know, the pace of repression to step up, maybe, and things to happen, you know, like the the 47 mm -hmm. people who were um, being held for having a primary poll, you know, their case I, I read today, it might not even be heard until the middle of next year. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of things to stop people talking about it, stop people reporting on it and and you know the, the these kind of cases risk being forgotten so just you know public discussion keeping hong kong in 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 the consciousness you know in the on the map is is mm -hmm. one thing although i i 
I also accept that it, it doesn't feel like much. Yeah, so then we have more questions. Uh, um, Excel is so fresh and um, share the F Financial Times article when it is ready. I guess, you know, we can share that on the same link of this uh, book talk. And then there's another question about why is defiance in Hong Kong today different? That's on your sense, radical defiance. And maybe, you know, another way is I've heard people saying, say that, you know, just even stay in your job could even be a form of defiance because, you know, you continue to occupy someone with a conscience, continue to occupy a position and continue to uphold what is right, continue to follow your conscience, continue to, to, to you know, insist on not lying, um, insist on basically the same principles and staying in touch with your friends and people with like minds. That's also another form of kind of like maybe defines today has to take the form of everyday form of resistance, just living in your normal life, res resisting the crackdown as the new normal. Um, but what's your take on that, you know, the different forms of defiance? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Victoria. It can take so many different forms. And I think for people who are, are living in Hong Kong, they you know, it's impossible for someone who's outside to to say what they should or shouldn't do. I think just existing is already tough in itself. Um, I, I know that a lot of people have been reading Václav Havel and The Power of the Powerless um, to try and <laughs> think about, you know, what type of defiance is even possible in such a state. Um, so... Um, I think, yeah, even small. So I, for, I do, I do agree though with this idea that, you know, maybe people outside can play more of a role in talking about Hong Kong and raising it and lobbying it and mm -hmm. speaking in a way that people, for people inside when they can't, although I don't know if it's speaking for people, but just ensuring that people continue to um, think about Hong Kong. Yeah, um, we have only just, just a couple of minutes left, but maybe just very quickly. That what you, you mentioned that the people outside, we have to conquer our fear. And at the same time, make sure that Hong Kong, you know, continues to be under the spotlight, because otherwise, for example, the cases of the 47, we do not want them to be forgotten. What else do you think, you know, Hong Kongers in exile could do? I think getting to know other Hong Kongers, building communities, uh, organizing events together, all of these things um, are useful. Um, I know that there's lobbying, political lobbying as well in countries, for example, um, in Australia, I know there is some lobbying about a Magnitsky Act, things like that. But uh, I mean, just the act of becoming a community together, I think, uh, and using, making links it, it is a start. Um, it's, you know, it, I think it, Hong Kong is a s small place, 7 million people. Um, and now we're seeing these massive outflows of people, but we also know that Hong Kongers are, you know, they're bright, they're strong, they're resilient, this can-do spirit. Um, they're very, very principled. We'll put principles above money, above almost everything else, you know. Maybe in exile, it, it's a time to use those principles. Well, thank you, Louisa. I've been instructed to stick to the time. And so let's um, pass back to Samuel. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, um, I'm going to take my uh, uh, privilege to uh, jump in and, and ask you a couple of quick things, Louisa, before we let you go. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think there are definitely a lot of very sort of uh, vivid sort of visceral moment, um, you know, just to tease people who haven't read the book, 
Uh, I've never seen Chris Patton speechless. Uh, you got him speechless in a in a moment of weakness uh, when you can you know actually post this question about what would you have done differently. And I, I encourage people to, to to dig into that part. I also I think um, was moved by how much of your own story that became naturally part of Hong Kong's story throughout. I mean, there was a scene where your son was with you, I think, uh, and during the break-in of the Lechko, where you just turned around and said to him, like, you should go home, and he just went home, and you went to the protest. Can, can you just talk about just that fusing of your own personal story? You know, you, just, you talked about this be- in between a reporter and participant. Yeah, I was quite reluctant to write about myself. I mean, I'm a journalist, and I originally wanted to write a very journalistic account, (laughs) you know, outside this story to do, you know, to, to, to sort of, you know, be a spectator. But it just became really, really hard for me to do that. I just found that all the sections that I was writing that were about my family, my background, you know, my links to Hong Kong were so much more vivid than the other parts. And then I just thought, you know, in a way, it's impossible to remove myself from Hong Kong, because Hong Kong has become part of me. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, maybe also not the right decision, because, you know, having spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and grown up there and covered the um, the handover, that those things did shape me. And so I, in the end, I did end up writing quite a lot about them. And I, you know, I, I began to think that that idea of removing yourself from the story and telling it as if you were sort of hovering above it, nothing to do with the story, it, it didn't work for me in a Hong Kong context at all. Um, so in the end, I kind of surrendered. <laughs> and I wrote in a much more personal way. Well, I, I, I for, for one, am very glad that you surrendered. Um, <laughs> and one, one, this is a, probably a loaded question, but a quick question that could be a one, answer, a one word answer here. Uh, I'm fascinated by the King of Kowloon. I actually um, never really paid any attention. It's one of those things that I just never thought about uh, growing up in Hong Kong. What is the verdict here? Irrationally crazy? Naively? Or just stubbornly defiant? (laughs) I, so I asked so many people, you know, uh, you know, I was so at first, I, I just wanted to know, you know, did he have a claim on the land? Was he crazy? And so I asked everybody and I just got a different answer from everybody. You know, I asked the curators that he worked with. Some said he was crazy. Some said he was delusional. Some said he was schizophrenic. But it, his neighbors said that they played Mahjong with him and he was perfectly capable of playing Mahjong and very polite. You know, the person who shot the ad with him said he didn't even know what swipe, what a cleaning product was, and he wasn't sure he understood the ad, and that after every sentence they asked him to say, he would add these sort of unintelligible words. Um, And so, but MC Yen, the singer from um, LMF, the band who who went out with him, he he thought he was pretending to be crazy because it was really good street craft and it stopped him from being arrested when he was out um, in the streets. So I never, I you know, I never really got to the bottom of <laughs> his mental state. You know, I think obsessive, stubborn, defiant, unique individual. Maybe it doesn't matter whether he was crazy or not. Maybe that's not the point. I could not help. I mean, when I finished uh, reading the book the first time, um, I left with this just sort of uh, resonance that that is, I think, who Hong Kongers are now. And I've heard Hong Kongers describe in all those ways and continues <laughs> to be described in those ways in this particular fight for 
after democracy and freedom, that it is both it is simultaneously irrational, naive, defiant, <laughs> and crazy, but in a way that is so ingenious in a way that um, I, I think that for me at least captures so much of what a Hong Kong identity has has evolved into. So I, I, I personally just appreciate that so much. So um, I want to encourage everybody uh, to jump in so that you still have a chance to uh, click on the link and actually uh, you might get a copy, a free copy of the book. We'll send it to you. Um, I, um, I want to close by um, saying that I grew up, you know, I, I, I felt like I was with you actually parallel to many of your story and time because, you know, I was there. We just weren't in the same exact space. But one of the things why I, I, we wanted, I wanted to do this, I wanted a campaign and, and the organization to co-host this today is because I never heard those history in schools and growing up in Hong Kong. It was never taught to me. And I think that there is not just that erasure, but also by connecting the history, it strengthens the fight ahead. Um, and I think the 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 part the, the part of the book where you talk about how people don't think about the before and the after, only the day of, and you describe your feeling of being a reporter on the day after the handover and just sort of aimlessly walking around. Uh, I think that this book and what you have done is to ground us again and give us some roots. And, and I think that's where I find strength to overcome the fear and to continue to put Hong Kong in the spotlight is to internalize and grow into those roots that you're now giving us. This is a great history lesson um, in a very personal, readable way. Uh, we're going to be sharing it with not just Hong Kongers, but uh, this is the book that I'm giving to people who are not familiar, who can't put their finger on a map to point out Hong Kong, because I think it's important that we know how we got here. And and I just want to say thank you so much for uh, for telling this story. Well, thank you so much for having me, Samuel and Victoria. Thank you. Well, thank you, Louisa. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, so remember, uh, we'll leave up the, the book giveaway link until tomorrow. So please uh, feel free to, uh, to, to sign in and uh, we will select randomly five people who get a free copy of the book uh, later tomorrow. And uh, but thank you again for joining us. And I want to thank again Hong Kong Forum, Sirius uh, for Hong Kong. Uh, Canadian Hong Kong Link uh, and the Hong Kong uh, CAN, uh, the Academic Network, um, for co-hosting today's uh, discussion. Thank you very much and have a good evening and have a good morning if you're in Australia. <laughs>